Great. Thank you and uh, a, a very warm welcome. My name is Amanda Sondi. Um, I'm the head of the department and the senior lecturer in contemporary Islam. It gives me so much pleasure to welcome you to this really, really special evening um, to celebrate um, one of our own. Um, he's now one of our celebrated uh, parts of the fixtures and fittings in the study of religions, uh, Brendan has published his book, which is has come out with Brill. It just gives me so much pleasure to, to welcome you all this evening, where he's going to talk to us a little bit about his book. Um, but Brendan has um, has journeyed, I think, with this department for a very long time, um, and, and we're just going to embarrass him all evening. But we are extremely proud um, of this, uh, of your achievement um, of getting your book published, getting it done and getting it out with Brill. Um, so on behalf of the department, on behalf of the school, on behalf of the college, on behalf of the university, <laughs> We are extremely proud of you, Brendan, and I'm going to pass you over to now, James. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aman. Um, so, um, yes, so welcome again to the book launch of the reception of Abdul Baha in Britain, East Comes West, um, by Dr. Brendan McNamara. Um, and um, in just a few minutes, I think Brendan's going to give a short presentation, um, uh, Kind of introductory presentation uh, on the book. But before that, I would like to invite um, Dr. Oliver Sharbrot, who's joining us from Birmingham, to say a few words uh, about about um, about the book. Um, perhaps he'll say a few words about the process of getting getting there. I don't know. Uh, Oliver, do we have you there? Yes, yes. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. And again, it's it's also my great pleasure and gives me great pride to be part of the book launch. Um, I mean, it's I think it's a premiere for me, and I think it's also, if I'm not mistaken, a premiere for the department, because Brendan is the first of my PhD students who's actually published uh, their PhD, uh, which again shows, uh, gives an indication of the, the caliber and the abilities of Brendan mm -hmm. as a PhD student. And I think, and the colleagues in Cork will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Brandon is also the first PhD student from the study of religious department who published uh, their PhD. So it's also, you know, a premier for, for the study of religions department. And I will hope I'll manage to indicate uh, in the next few minutes, and I keep my remarks very brief, um, you know, why, you know, this is kind of a you know, very deserved achievement. I, I say a few words um, about the, the PhD and the book, um, although it's perhaps a bit unfair uh, towards Brent because he will obviously give a presentation. But I mean, very briefly, I mean, it's his book is about the reception of Abdul Baha in Britain in the early 20th century. And Abdul Baha, as you probably know, was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. Uh, he, Abdul Baha, was born into uh, an Iranian aristocratic family. Um, but spent most of his life in exile in various parts of the Ottoman Empire because of, you know, the, you know, religious claims, the prophetic claims and the activities of his father. Um, and he became, after the death of his father, he became leader of uh, the Baha'i faith um, uh, and is obviously therefore a very significant figure in the sort of formative period of the Baha'i faith. Now, as far as I know, the early followers in the West of the Baha'i faith emerged in the late 19th century in North America, but there were also then uh, various communities or early communities emerging in Europe in the early 20th century. And, you know, Abdul Baha was, you know, imprisoned uh, for several decades in the Ottoman Empire before he sort of finally settled in Haifa and was able, um, after he was released in 1908, to travel to these new communities in Europe and North America between 1910 and 1913, and did two very extensive stops in Britain. And that is sort of the subject matter of, of Brendan's book. And of, there has been quite a lot of research done by Baha'is themselves on these visits, because obviously they're part of the, the community history. They're part of you know, the, 
the formation of, of Baha'i communities um, in the West and are therefore quite significant in terms of the formation of um, you know, Baha'i communities in Europe and North America, um, because there is a kind of a personal connection, obviously, between you know, the communities that have emerged in Europe in the early 20th century and you know, Abdul Baha as a sort of holy figure, as the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith. So, uh, and you know, these uh, you know, community histories have focused, if you like, on you know, the people he, Abdul Baha met, you know, where he went to, and you know, the role these visits had in sort of establishing and forming, consolidating these very early communities. And yet they might have mentioned whom he met, but they didn't dwell necessarily very long on who these people were, and particularly why they were interested in receiving Abdul Bar in the very first place. The other type of scholarship uh, that has been produced on those figures Brandon deals with in his book, uh, who are all you know quite significant figures in terms of, if you like, the the church establishment, you know, liberal Protestantism in the early sort of late 19th, early 20th century. So the other stream of scholarship uh, has approached them more because they were interested in the kind of the history, the modern intellectual history of Protestantism, of liberal Protestantism in, in, in Britain, and have very much focused on, if you like, the sort of Christian aspects of, of these figures and have entirely disregarded, uh, um, you know, the engagement of, of many of these quite significant and important and prominent figures at that time with non-Christian religions uh, and with Abdul Baha um, in particular. So, um, you know, the, the, the significant contribution of, of Brandon's book is really in uh, highlighting um, the, 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 the engagement of, of, of very, very, you know, colorful, very, very interesting figures with um, you know, non-Christian religions, the kind of theological, intellectual environment in which this kind of um, uh, engagement uh, occurred, um, which sort of equally illustrates that, and that's, of, I think, you know, a major sort of takeaway point uh, of Brandon's book, that if you like an engagement with, you know, religious diversity, taking other religions, non-Christian traditions seriously, is not something that you know we would assume is, is recent, but you know it goes back, um, you know, to sort of the late Victorian uh, sort of Edwardian period in the British context, and uh, you know these figures, you know, Dean Wilberforce, who was the dean of you know uh, Westminster, um, uh, R. J. Campbell, who was, if you like, Britain's first evangelical superstar. Tudor Paul, who played a very important role in promoting kind of Celtic spirituality. So all these figures were quite significant, quite important figures, and all shared an immense interest and also great admiration for Abdul Baha. And um, you know, by focusing on on the motivation of these figures for receiving Abdul Baha and placing you know the reception uh, of Abdul Baha you know by these figures within their broader if you like, interest in alternative religions, you know, non-Christian religions, and the vantage points, uh, vantage points from which you know this engagement occurred, you know, that's you know a major um, contribution. Now, it's obviously uh, you know a major achievement. I mean, you know, Brill is is uh, one of the most prestigious uh, academic publishers mm. uh, in the world, um, and the 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 series in which it is published, uh, Newman is one of the most established series uh, in the the study of religion. So um, again, it, it gives you an indication of you know the the caliber and the quality of the work that Brandon has produced. And uh, I'm just holding it into the camera because I was assuming that Brandon would probably be too modest to <laughs> show off the book. So I just thought uh, before I forget uh, to give you an indication of how it looks like. Um, I mean, it was actually. I mean, of course, I, I, Brandon will certainly say a few words about his side from the uh, of the experience. But I mean, being Brandon's supervisor was, um, I mean, was an extreme pleasure because he just knew what he was doing. I mean, he's an excellent researcher. Um, he is extremely thorough, very extremely conscientious. You know, has an excellent style of writing. So it was, you know, I didn't have to do really that much. Um, and in addition to you know being such an excellent researcher. 
he is the kindest person, the most generous person oh. to work with. So um, again, congratulations um, again, uh, Brandon, to this major achievement. And uh, you know, hopefully there will be uh, you know more publications of that sort to come. Thank you so much, Oliver. Wow. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Oliver, for that uh, wonderful uh, account of the of, of the book and or at least of the origins of the book and um, and your experience with Brendan as supervisor. Um, I'm not sure when, we, we, when we're due to do our first clap, but I think we'll let Brendan speak and then we can clap Brendan once he's once he's spoken himself um, about um, about the, about the book. So I'll give the floor to you, Brendan. Did you want to put some PowerPoint a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> Oh. I, I, I will have a couple of slides, but I, I would yeah. just like to thank Oliver and, and James and, and, and Aman and, and everybody actually for coming. Uh, I always wondered if I'd ever have the opportunity to use the word nonplussed in a sentence. And now is the time I'm completely nonplussed by, by what Oliver has said and uh, his very kind words. And uh, uh, I'm sure I gave him a lot of trouble, actually. One of my difficulties was... <laughs> The minute I would find something interested, uh, interesting, I'd want to go down that road. <laughs> Oliver was an extremely good and wonderful supervisor and mentor, and he, I owe him a lot actually in getting to this stage of the process. But I do want to thank, and on an occasion like this, I won't speak too long about the book. I'll have a few slides and I'll just gloss over a few things. Uh, not gloss over a few things. I'll mention a few things. <laughs> it's not good in an academic uh, <laughs> setting to say that you're going to gloss over a few things. Uh, I'll mention a few things and, um, and, and there might be some comments and some questions, but it is an opportunity really to thank everybody. I, I, I see everybody that is here and, and I have some very dear friends and family. My wife Noreen is here and uh, it gives an opportunity to really thank because I think everybody knows who does this kind of work, it's never one's own. You know, it's always a matter of family and friends. It's colleagues and mentors, it's people like Oliver, and it's uh, it's people like James, who's been extremely helpful, Lydia, um, Marion, Tatsuma, Siobhan in the department, and 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 latterly, of course, uh, uh, our man as head of the department has been exceedingly supportive and, 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 and Rachel. So it's, a, it's really a combination of um, everybody's endeavor. Uh, the conversations, the discussions, this space which where we usually have the postgraduate seminar has been a really important uh, element in that too. And, and I hope if I know some of our postgraduate students are here that it might seem some way of an encouragement that if I can get through this and I get to the stage where I get something published, get the, 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 the thesis done, the PhD, that, that it will also seem like there is light at the end of that tunnel as well. You know, so to all of you, I'm I'm deeply grateful and, and I'm completely uh, embarrassed and, and mortified, as my mother used to say. I'm absolutely mortified about all those things. But maybe if I just go straight on and just talk a little bit about about the book and uh, Ol um, Oliver kindly showed you a copy. It's, it's got this wonderful. I have to say when I saw it, I was really delighted with it. There's this wonderful picture on it that a very good friend of mine, Dylan O'Leal, who's a wonderful graphic artist, found this little small postcard and did some magic with it. And it's of a bridge, London Bridge, coming over to the Houses of Parliament. And it seemed to me so apposite that it would, it would show this picture, East Comes West, that this bridge, and you see the Houses of Parliament, this iconic uh, symbol of, 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 of Britain. And uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to him also. But of course, the first thing you do also realize is that once it's in a book form, you can't change anything anymore, which I've been able to do for years and years and years with this. And uh, the first thing you see, of course, is stray commas and, and, and things like that, that you hoped had all been eliminated. In any event, let's just spend a few minutes just talking about it. And Oliver has given a really good, um, uh, oh, yeah. It should be a good introduction to the book, and I hopefully I won't uh, um, I won't repeat too many of the things that he has so eloquently said. So um, this is the book. It's uh, uh, the reception of Abdul Baha. East comes west, and um, if I just get on to the next slide, uh, what it does actually cover, and I'll, I'll just go through these very quickly. It relates to this particular time period in Britain, at the turn of the 20th century, and it seeks to recover these, recondite these kind of uh, overlooked aspects of a vibrant religious milieu or a vibrant milieu concerning religions at the time. Uh, I've described it as a field of religious inquiry populated by a homegrown British religious reformers who sought connection to religions from the East. And I set out to explain why and how they did so. 
and then thereafter uh, to see why these events and these figures have become overlooked, have become obscure in the in the records, if you like. So I've done a number of things. I hope I've done a number of things. I don't know I've done them well. I've looked closely at the contemporary religious discursive environment from different perspectives, but I really wanted to look at it. I mean, as Oliver mentioned, I would be quite familiar with the story of Abdul Baha from from the perspective of Baha'i literature, but not from that other perspective to the lens or to the to the eyes of those homegrown actors, uh, some of whom I will introduce to you briefly in a moment. So I examined some of the intellectual stirrings around religions. This is the era of the beginning, really, of the academic study of religion, isn't it? The, the birth of the science of religion, Max Muller and his very influential work, um, comparative religion. And I, I look at the work of Max Muller and how that contributed to this milieu, uh, but also other less known doyens of the birth of the of, of the academic or science of religion. For example, J.E. Carpenter, who published a very um, celebrated monograph titled Comparative Religion in 1930. And I was just reading the other day, looking up again, it was some 30 years in print. He was the principal of Manchester College in Oxford and hosted Abdul Baha in Oxford in the college on the last day of 1912. So another interesting aspect of this, of course, is the, lands, the, the religious landscape, the Victorian crisis of faith, this much used descriptor trope, which has, in fact, become over the years problematized by scholars who have now recast their understanding of that period as being one really actually greatly influenced by religion or more can more aptly be described as a crisis of doubt, far from people simply losing their religion. Of course, some people did. It was a great period of fervor, and one scholar describes as the last great effort to evangelize in Britain, which led to different responses. And some of those elicited were religious responses, the construction of new frame frameworks out of the mainstream. And one aspect of some of these new frameworks was to seek connection to religions outside of Christianity. It's, it's, it's in, an interesting period. It's one of those periods that once I started reading about it, I wanted to know every, everything about until Oliver said, well, come back, come back on track. Um, Moore, for example, when he's writing about this period, he says, if the Victorians could only have used our terminology to describe their sense of crisis, you know, it would have been very much more easy to discern what was happening. But of course they don't. And I think that's also important in any kind of historical uh, uh, endeavor to understand that we're really trying to, in some ways, we're trying to translate something into a, into the language that we use today. Anyway, another important uh, uh, element around the landscape around that period is the understanding that we're within really the maelstrom of the colonial project, um, not necessarily at the height of it, but certainly very much still in it. There is a, an efflorescence around this time in the creation or the construction of knowledge about religions of the East the adoption of Orientalist conceptions, not to get into too much detail, but uh, Ghanaia Basiri, when he's talking about the the, uh, the birth of, 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 or the development of Islam in the United States, he talks about this conflation of race, religion, and progress underpinning what amounts to really the subjugation of peoples and countries through colonization. So religion is very much involved in that, and people's understanding or knowledge of religions is becoming uh, extended or amplified through the fact that there is more contact with countries because of colonialism. So again, I go into this in the Orientalist model that, it, that, that might fit with some of these transactions, not definitely not Saidian in, in its true sense, more affirmative or romantic. And so all of these things are discussed in the book at some length and there as a foundation or as a background to the um, reception of Abdul Baha. And then after that, what piqued my interest, of course, uh, is, the, to, is to try and work out why would these encounters be so so obscure? And, and how do you actually find out about these encounters anyway, when some of the material thereafter doesn't really deal with them? As James mentioned, they're looked at from a particular perspective through the lens of the Protestant perturbation of the period, the whole period before the First World War, how that's understood. And we are butting up against this great climacteric, the First World War, which really has a great impact on this religious field, uh, this, really, this, this era of religious inquiry on the part of seekers and people who are interested and scholars and so forth. And that the First World War definitely had the effect of take, you know, bursting the balloon of this 
of this movement, it, this particular religious field. It let the air out, if you want to put it in those terms. Uh, and um, what's probably interesting is how that occurred uh, and how the war and, and the, the coming up to the war uh, ended in or re re resulted in that uh, collapsing of that particular worldview that was very universalist and out in outlook um, and how that affected these individuals, some of whom I, I mentioned to you in a moment, and how in a sense they suffered. I mean, James once said this to me and James, I have put it in the book because I thought it was so good how they suffered a crisis of values and their stories around the war are very important towards understanding how things were recorded afterwards. Um, so uh, there is a complexity in how these uh, uh, th this period is looked at, how it's considered. And one of the uh, contributors to that complexity is how the chief protagonists themselves recorded their own history, having been through this, uh, this uh, very difficult period in their lives. Anyway, I'm going to try and really move on quite quickly to, to, to this next next slide, if I can. Ah, so I'm, I'm going to mention this because when I started out um, at the beginning, I was looking at the fact that a number of very interesting figures came to Britain around this time and contributed to this uh, religious discussion, this efflorescence around religion. And you will know some of them. Um, Terence Thomas in his wonderful book, which goes back a few years now, The British and Their Beliefs, he talks about it as East Comes West. So I borrowed that from him. But it's more ideas he's talking about rather than people. But when I looked at it, I found, yes, we had Vivekananda, Inayat Khan and, uh, and Angarika Dharmapala, whom people will remember from the book launch with, with uh, 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 Brian and Alicia and Lawrence was a confederate of Udamaloka and they traveled together in Sri Lanka. And these people came at this time and not to go into their stories because they are wonderful and interesting, but it's clear that there's very little record from the perspective of the people who received them in Britain. Their stories are also told in the context of their own, uh, in, the, in the material related to them, written, written by their communities. But there's very little actually written about, about their interactions with people in Britain. And uh, <clears throat> they're, they're fantastic and very interesting people. Vivekananda and Dharmapala were, if you like, stars of the World Parliament of Religions. Vivekananda, it is Vedantist movement. Dharmapala is a uh, is a, you know, such an important figure in the development of uh, Buddhist modernism. And in Inayat Khan, who might might you might not know so well, was the founder of the of Western Sufism. So I thought, well, th this is a kind of a category of of visit. These are are very interesting people. And I remember when I was with Oliver talking to Brian about first doing this as a PhD, he quite rightly said, well, these are these are really interesting. These are stars. And I said, well, actually, I'm going to want to take somebody who's probably not that well known, Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha was, if you like, of this group of people is probably the least well known. And um, which is one of the reasons amongst another number of reasons, which I'll mention that I thought uh, would be interesting to focus on him. So maybe if I can just get this next slide. Yeah, so here's Abdul Baha and, and Brian, or Oliver rather, has very well explained who he is and his background, that he was the head of the Baha'i faith and that the Baha'i faith emerged from this Iranian Shia background. From childhood, he was a prisoner and an exile across various different cities, eventually in the Syrian province of Palestine in what is today Israel. But he became, even throughout all this incarceration and house arrest, he became a very well-known religious figure throughout the Levant. And, and Oliver himself has written about this in his book, in his Abdul Baha's relationship to uh, Muhammad Abdu, who was a very important figure in Sunni Islam. But following the Young Turk Re Revolution, he was allowed to, he was released. And one of the things that he began to do was to to travel and come to come to Britain. Now, of course, he didn't just arrive and immediately start to to do all the things that he did. He um, he had there was a number of people again. Oliver mentioned this who were already regarded themselves as as interested adherents, even in some cases admirers. Some of them very prominent in in religious life in Britain. And there was also, and I go into this in the book, and I won't go into it too much now, there was also a kind of a sense of a knowledge of Baha'i in Britain as well. There was a, 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 a familiarity with the story of the 
primer or the first figure in the of the founding figures of the Baha'i faith called the Bab, a person who became came before Baha'u'llah, who had been who had gathered around him thousands and thousands of followers, but who was executed by firing squad in Tabriz in 1850. And his story and the story of his followers, many of whom were killed in a general pogrom that took place, or a series of pogroms that took place afterwards. His story was very well known in Europe, uh, dating from the 1850s, primarily through the work of, of scholars like E.G. Brown from Cambridge and others. And Brown also knew Andrew. So there was, there was a kind of a familiarity. I was uh, thinking about this uh, recently and um, how somebody has just done a little bit of a troll through Irish newspapers of the time from the 1850s. And the level of coverage of the uh, tribulations of the Bob and his followers that appeared in papers like the King's County Chronicle and the, the Roscommon Herald is quite extraordinary. Mostly syndicated pieces taken from papers in the United Kingdom, but all in all, a huge amount of coverage. You could follow the story over a period of, of, of a number of years, the story of the Bob in these papers. And if anybody knows the name of what the, the present name of Kings County, there'll be, um, well, there won't be a prize, but, but if you know what Kings County is now, uh, you're, um, you're certainly going to uh, uh, maybe not get a prize, but yeah, good, it's good. So uh, uh, again, there's lots really to talk about in terms of, of background and, uh, and there's other things as well. There are cultural uh, connections, there are uh, connections between the Iranian constitutional crisis in terms of coverage and how that also backgrounded the coming to Britain of Abdul Baha. So I chose to concentrate on Abdul Baha. He didn't come from a colonial milieu. I thought that was interesting. He was the head of a religion that emerged out of an Islamic context. So he wasn't reforming from within. So I thought that was also another different, discrete uh, uh, aspect that could be could be looked at. And arguably, his was the most prominent visit of all the others in terms of the press coverage and the public gatherings and the material that I could find immediately. Now, if somebody goes looking, they might find other material about the others for sure. So it meant that there was lots of material in, in that. And I guess also I should say I was interested, and I am a Baha'i, and my interest, and Oliver mentioned, I wouldn't have known the story from this from the point of view of, of Baha'i literature. Um, and I thought, my goodness, there is another story to be told here. So I've had this discussion with myself about insider, outsider. I'm looking at the development of Protestant theodicies uh, um, from a perspective, uh, and of course, everybody has a perspective, and I, I actually refer to that in the introduction as well. It's a, a, a discussion around that and how we can, uh, how we need to uh, be reflexive around these things as well. So, in a sense, then, I would say, and I'm, I'm going to come to a conclusion very quickly, just one or two things to, to, to say maybe about the importance of the book is that in a way it's not actually about Abdul Baha in a sense. There's a lot about him there, a lot of detail, background, but uh, how his story exemplifies a category of visits from that time. Uh, but uh, really there's very little academic uh, consideration, apart from uh, some of uh, Oliver's book, which covers it, and a wonderful book by Lil Osborne about the development of the Baha'i community, an academic book about the development of the Baha'i community in Britain. But there isn't very much that is actually looked at, uh, has, there isn't but much there covering uh, the uh, focus on, on these visits. Well, I should actually just maybe before I, I, I go to the, why this is, I feel this is important, I should introduce you to some of these people. Here they are. There, this is just a, 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 some of them, and these are such fascinating and interesting uh, characters. Um, um, Oliver mentioned some of them, Wesley Tudor Pole who was so centrally involved with Alice Buckton, actually, who was a very well-known playwright and poet of her time. They were involved in the development of a Celtic um, movement or around, eventually around Glastonbury. And if people are familiar with the Chalice Well uh, property in Glastonbury, he was the founder of the Chalice Well. Alice Buckton was connected with it even beforehand. And he was a very, also a big admirer, a great admirer of, of Abdul Baha. Carpenter, I mentioned, who was a, a, a scholar and an academic who also received and um, hosted Abdul Baha in Manchester College. Sarah Blumfield, oh, I can get back, get back. Sorry about that. Everything was going so well with the technology, but here you go. <laughs> so back again, Sarah Blumfield, who uh, was Abdul Baha's host. She was Lady Blumfield. 
But in fact, she was from Boris Allais in County Tipperary. She was Sarah Louise Ryan. She was also a, a person who was very connected to a lot of the movements and uh, religious uh, journeying that was going on in, in Britain at that time uh, around theosophy, around, around Buddhism, around Vivekananda and Vedantism. Uh, and and also around Baha'i, but these were people who were connected to each other. And then you have these two doyens, these two kind of very central clerical figures from the uh, center of orthodoxy, uh, Archdeacon Wilberforce, he was the Dean of uh, Westminster, and R.J. Campbell, who really was a, an extraordinary famous uh, figure. And both of them hosted Abdul Baha, uh, to and invited him, which is which was quite extraordinary, to speak from the pulpit in their churches. Now, if I tell you that Campbell would have two services each each Sunday, to each of which three and a half thousand people usually showed up, you have some idea of of the the uh, the um, the draw that he had. Now, interestingly, when when you're looking at trying to find the information about all this. It's not necessarily in the accounts that that are there afterwards. One of the great uh, sources that I found, and this will be the last thing before I comment on, on, on why it's important, uh, was the this Christian Commonwealth magazine. Oh, that's about yeah, OK. This is the Christian Commonwealth newspaper. I spent a lovely few days uh, in the Bud Lane uh, looking over this, and it's just extraordinary as a synchronous repository of the discussions that were going on around religion that you can't find everywhere. I, I put this page here because it's quite unique and I don't think it has ever been seen seen before how Abdul Baha's talk or uh, presentation at Manchester College on the last day of 1912 is, is completely reproduced and people who will know the language in Arabic. And there was a complete mystery around why that was. But it was part of this extraordinary the, uh, discussion that was shown through these, this newspaper where you'd have people. Who, it was a vehicle for Campbell. It was quite well uh, uh, distributed, lots of uh, lots of uh, issues sold. And this became, if you like, drawing the elements together from the various aspects that I mentioned was like trying to get a lens together to look at this period and look at these people who received Abdul Baha. And it was this particular publication that gave focus to that lens. So that's what, if, you, if you want to think, it in the, think of it in those terms. OK, so then why is it important finally? Sorry for going on so long. Well, there's various different scholars have talked about this uh, period, but without going into it in the way that I have gone into it here, they've, they've talked about, for example, uh, oh, I should say, I, I titled this uh, slide especially for Elizabeth Erdman <laughs> because she gave this wonderful talk here, our presentation here a few weeks ago called Why Should We Be Interested in the Minoans and Crete? And I went away thinking, I'd really love to write that book. What a title. And in a way, she was talking about this period that she's uh, investigating and was explaining why we should we be interested in that period. And uh, quite a bit of it, of course, is because it throws light on aspects of what we're confronted with, or what we're interested in today. I think that's 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 one of the things that, that she mentioned. But also there have been a number of scholarly references or uh, treatments of this period without going into it and examine it in the, examining it in the way that I've done here. Trump talks about our trajectory of consciousness, that we owe it to ourselves and our self-knowledge to understand this period uh, because this period a lot of, of 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 what has happened thereafter in terms of uh, of of discussion around religions, particularly, uh, uh, it, it it begins here. Not Kim Not the, the wonderful Kim Not talks about this period and its relationship to the counterculture of the 1960s, as does von Stuckrad, who talks about this cultural turntable that it came around again in the 1960s. But really, it has its its genesis in this period. He talks about how. The esoteric is deeply embedded in Western culture over the last 200 years, but it has suffered from this dialectic of rejection and fascination. Uh, and then again, it, just to mention, this, this is probably uh, a little bit going into a little bit too much detail, but we could look then also at how that period is looked at as being something of a cultic milieu 
to use Colin Campbell's construct about the 60s and 70s, which really doesn't do it justice. And hopefully some of what I've written in the book will bear that out. So I was thinking of Benjamin in now time. I was thinking particularly of Walter Benjamin when I was saying that Oliver used to keep me on the straight and narrow because when I came across Walter Benjamin in now time, it goes to Elizabeth's point. Uh, I was really kind of uh, taken with everything that he had written. Um, uh, we are interested in these things because of, of what happens, what happens today. And uh, Benjamin felt nothing should be lost to history. Um, he talked about uh, he talked about everybody's story. Everybody's story should be should be told. This is an entangled and connected history. And I think the point is, and this is something that I, I owe also to discussion with Brian some years ago, that really it points up that there isn't really very much new to interreligious dialogue or culture or religious borrowing. It's not a new feature of the world today, should I say. It's Genesis goes back to this period. And maybe there are things we can learn from a deeper understanding of that period. And maybe we can uh, learn something from how the fig these figures were engaged in their discussion around religions ever before we thought this was pop popular or necessary. And I put Paul Cleese thing in there just because I thought that's a lovely painting that he, Walter Benjamin, once owned. Sorry for going on so long. And thank you so much for all your um, lovely comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brendan. It's always an absolute uh, pleasure to listen to you uh, speak about your research um, so so eloquently. And uh, I remember uh, with great fondness a lot of our conversations, especially around evangelicalism in 19th century uh, Britain, when you I think you were preparing the chapter there on the crisis of crisis of faith. Um, so I'm going to chair the next um, part of t this evening's event um, with a question and answer session. And um, so I'll open the floor. Um, I think the best thing to do, if, if, if you have a question, I'm going to open the chat function and just make yourself known in the chat. It's easier than putting your hand up because I don't have enough, um, you know, my screen doesn't show everybody at the same time. So if you pop a, just an indication in the chat that you'd like to ask a question and then I, I can uh, uh, take everybody in turn. Nothing's appeared yet. Does anybody anybody have a question? Does everybody know how to access the chat? If you go to the across the top, there's the kind of um, looks like a speech bubble with lines in it. That's the chat. Click there and you can type in um, if you have a have a question. Just to mention, James, that not everybody will have the chat function if they've signed in on the web version of, of Microsoft Teams. Oh, OK. OK, it, maybe if they don't have the chat, they can put up their hands. Yeah. Oh, Lawrence. Uh, OK, I'm seeing some hands come up. Great. Fantastic. So I've got one hand from Lawrence first, I think, and then a hand from Alexandra. Um, Brendan, thanks a million for that. <laughs> it was really, really interesting. Uh, looking forward to reading the book. Um, I'm really interested just in this bigger thing that you're saying about this period, which strikes me as paradoxical in terms of a more linear view of history, because I mean, clearly there is a lot of religious fervor in Britain at this time, which is strange given both um, the long history of kind of enlightenment and critique of religion in elite circles, uh, already strong in Britain by the 18th century, but then the rise of secularism and free thought in working class circles. Uh, and yet then there, there is this period when Britain seems in some ways to get more religious uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Do, do, did you have any thoughts on what's going on? Why does it suddenly loom so large again? <laughs> I don't really know, actually, I didn't really investigate why that was, um, but it is quite fascinating that uh, we would have this idea of the Victorian crisis of faith with the, with the rise of, of the development of science and you know, the effects of, of, of uh, new thinking, that people were kind of dropping off religion, when in fact it was a, a period of tremendous uh, fervor. And, a, and an attempt to Christianize Britain, I think Moore was one of the great scholars of that period, talks about this, the last great effort to Christianize Britain. 
and it, 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 I think it, uh, it incited different responses. And, and of course, like all these things, they're not, they're not so um, easily able to, you know, to, to kind of, uh, to define how one thing comes and another thing connects to it. But you have this, this development of a response to that amongst liberal Protestant Christians in particular, and also amongst people who were part of the intelligentsia or the landed class. There are people who have the time, and who have, who have the, uh, the resources to be able to sit around and think about these things. You know, the, the, so for the most part, this is one of the big differences between this period and the counterculture, which was students and, and people who were, who were um, from different, different classes. This is very much from the, 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 these people are very much, not all, of course, from the upper classes in Britain. Who are and this is one of I think this is a response to that. So you have people who are very embedded in the establishment, like Wilberforce and like Campbell, who are um, who are who are really connectors between various different um, various different philosophies and new religious movements, new religious ideas older religions that are that, that are for the first time coming into Britain, and it's quite extraordinary. But what is what is I suppose what I've tried to say in the book is that all of that understanding of that was was really lost and skewed after the First World War. And um, and it's even hard because of some of the accounts that were were written, as Oliver mentioned, from the perspective of the Protestant religious perturbation of that time uh, didn't really take account of it. In fact, Robbins, a, a great scholar, that he said there was no reason to look outside Christianity to explain the crises that we were in. In fact, all these people were looking outside Christianity to a great extent. Thanks. Sorry, Lawrence, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for the question, Lawrence. Um, and I think Alexandra is next. Alexandra Grisa. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Alexandra is at Trinity College, and I see not everybody knows everybody here. Um, and if uh, Jenny hasn't done so, sorry, I was a bit late. Um, I put on my president hat for a moment and convey the congratulations of the Irish Society for the Academic Study of Religion to this wonderful book. I think we can be really proud um, of having a member that, who, who produced a work which covers actually all of the aspects of the study of religion in, a, in an exemplary way. Um, and personally, for me, it is wonderful to have seen steps and bits and pieces and now seeing this outcome and the, the others already said um, with this publisher, it's really wonderful. So I admit that's not really a question, but <laughs> if I may add um, a special interest of mine and struggling with um, the situation we are in, the study of religion, looking at the study of religion as part of the history of, of religion and describing this dialectic um, this is what uh, Hans Kippenberg has done in, in an exemplary way as well. And I can see that you are doing this um, in a way that shows that zooming in and doing thorough historical analysis is always linked with um, creating a systematic question which makes it relevant not only for specialists in that field but makes it relevant for everyone and i think this is something um i haven't read it but what i've heard over the over the last months and years and what what you just uh, presented i can see that this is in there so i have a question <laughs> in the end what do you think of uh, creating a project um bringing this together and kind of writing further what Hans Kippenberg has done, uh, classical thinkers and not so classical thinkers and religious figures and the interaction between the study of religion and the history of religion of different areas. Um, we could start something like that next year when the BASR has this beautiful kind of visions of our discipline. What do you think about that? <laughs> 
I think, it's a, I think it's a great idea. Thank you for your kind comments, Alexandra. It does give me the opportunity also to to say how much the Irish Society for the Academic Study of Religions and the, the whole process of that has been so helpful to me in my academic work uh, in, in terms of being involved and the, the conferences and, and and having the opportunity to present and 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 hear back uh, feedback from from colleagues, uh, it's it's been absolutely tremendous. So I think it's I think you know it's a really good idea. I, I'm I'm also thinking, and I don't know if it is connected, of what what Brian is talking about in terms of like a new a, a new genre of religious studies that I kind of think about it in terms of Ireland in particular is looking at the period before independence and that whole uh, milieu which in a way is is somewhat comparable to what happened in Britain in the, with the Second World War, how something like that skews understanding of, of a period and religion is looked at in a very myopic way when people are looking back. And uh, and so like the work that, that, that Oliver Lawrence and Alicia have done around Udama Loka, uh, the work that Tyg Foley, I think Tyg might be here and if he is, hello Tyg, uh, around, uh, around Max Arthur McAuliffe, um, I've been recently looking at, at, at a very obscure figure called James O'Keneilly, who translated Wahhabi texts in India in uh, in the mid, in, in, you know, he was a scholar of it, but he was also part of the Indian civil service. So it's quite complex, but it's quite complex in terms of Irish history. So it kind of complexifies Irish history as well as opens up new understanding of, of that of that period. I was actually recent, re recently looking at a newspaper that you know, one of the really central figures in the War of Independence, if, if I'm correct, is a guy called General Barry. What was his first name? I can't think of it. But he was turned down, apparently, in his application for the Indian Civil Service. You know, so being a being a, a, a nationalist here didn't preclude people from being involved, involved in empire. That's probably going into too much. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very interesting, <clears throat> interesting period. Thanks, Alexander. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. So we have a couple more questions. I think we have Elizabeth waiting and then Brian um, after Elizabeth, please. Have you, you're still on mute, Elizabeth? Sorry, no, I got it. Um, Brendan, first of all, thank you so much for, it's an honor that you used that and it's so inspiring. <laughs> and also that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So um, very helpful. I So I have two questions that actually are something that you said are your difficulties and they're rabbit hole questions, but I'm just curious, what is the, um, is there any influence that you know at that time from American spiritualism? Because that that was kind of the thing here that predates the theosophy coming in and it also spread even all around the world and it's, it's a really fascinating thing and it, I was just wondering what the, yeah, if that had any influence it was you know that same victorian time here and here it allowed people to speak that weren't allowed to and then when theosophy came it became reinscribed page um hierarchy a bit compared to the spiritualism and then the second question is and this is a real rabbit hole one but like what is the connection with like baha'i and and manny and and manichaeism because like it has this certain quality that's so similar in the in the and also the response sometimes of, um, you know, he was killed and, the, you know, there's just some rabbit hole questions. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm sure I don't know what the answer to the second question is. It's a really good one. I'll have to, I'll have to go on and have a think about that. And uh, it was wonderful to hear about your project when we heard about it uh, recently as well, Elizabeth. Um, I, I don't see any in, in looking at it, any particular influence of American spiritualism in the development of the of the different networks around uh, what Gies called spiritual journeying outside of Christianity uh, of that period. Um, there were Americans involved, of course, but they were usually s similar and um, similar in terms of background and orientation to the people who were involved with um with abdul baha theosophy is a big thing there's no doubt about it there are, there are influences of of vivekananda buddhism this celticist uh, movement around a particular artifact that was found in glastonbury that was a um uh, felt by some people to have been in the possession of jesus that was wesley tudor's pole find in glastonbury and i i didn't share it but i had a slide of the daily express 
report on that. And the reason I, I actually opened the book with this and with Oliver and I discussed it because it's a report from uh, July 1907-1908 from the Daily Express reporting on this meeting that takes place in the Dean of Westminster's house of 40 very prominent people all connected in, from, from the establishment but also connected to all these strands of religious and movements and philosophies who were discussing this cup and the newspaper devotes a front page to it and an editorial and they say 20 years ago people would have laughed about this but now we are so interested in all these things and these very prominent people are giving their time to it so in a way th th there isn't a, a connection and i suppose one of the reasons too is that there's a very direct connection in in, in a colonial sense between britain and some of the figures that would have come you know, there, there is a kind of a revisiting of, 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 of you know, the, like, the likes of Vivekananda. I hope somebody will do something around Vivekananda and Dharmapala in, in Britain and what they did and how they kind of returned in a sense, having being products of colonial background. And of course, there's political as well as religious uh, orientations to what they were doing as well. So, sorry, I'm going on too long. Aman, you should t tell me to stop. <laughs> the uh, uh, Brian is Brian is patiently waiting uh, Sorry, Brian. for uh, for, to, to come in. Brian, can can we invite you to ask your question? You're, you're on mute, Brian. Uh, just just very very briefly, add my congratulations, Brendan. And uh, right from the beginning, I've been absolutely confident that you would get your PhD and and we'd have a, a book out. And well done. So it doesn't seem to have taken very long, but maybe it has done to you. I don't know. Um, so I, I've got a question, and, and I'm not not sure it's the right question to ask. But um, I, I I love the, the front page of that um, publication that uh, R. J. Campbell sent round to his. You said seventy thousand people, mm -hmm. and so there was a mailing list of seventy thousand. It, 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 it was a newspaper actually, Brian, that was published weekly. Oh called the Christian Commonwealth, ah. but he was the person who was the editorial chair, the chair of the editorial board. Sorry, it didn't make that clear. Is there, is there, a, is there an, um, a mailing list? Or did people go and buy it in a shop? People went it? out and, oh. and bought it. I think it cost a halfpenny. Oh. And, okay. um, and right. they also send many, many uh, thousands of copies abroad to various different right. and all over the English speaking world. And many of the uh, stories that were contained there found their way into mainstream press in different parts of the English speaking world. So what I, what I was really sort of trying to get at was you said you, you said just now that um, essentially, you know, these were elite people who had the time to um, get involved. And, you know, there's a sort of Maslow hierarchy where, you know, you've got everything else. So then you start searching for meaning. And whereas, you know, the working people uh, perhaps, you know, didn't have the luxury of. But at the same time, where, when, when this was going on with Campbell and so on, there would have still presumably been a huge missionary effort. And you'd always have people back from the colonies and so on going around fundraising. And the general tenet of that would have been that, uh, you know, these people are without religion and they need to be 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 given it and, um, you know, brought up and civilized and all those kinds of things. And I just wondered um, if he if he published this newspaper, you know, with Arabic on the front and uh, basically endorsing what um, Abdul Baha was saying, um, did that not create some kind of controversy um, or did it not show up to some extent whether the people who read his his thoughts in, in, the, in the newspaper actually agreed with him or what what was what was going on because that suggests a huge um what lawrence would call plebeian population you know what sort of you know self-educated and so forth i mean just can you say something about that well, i think it's fascinating um <coughs> because he, he he certainly was somebody who was uh, hugely popular and quite controversial I mean, he did elicit a response from the establishment who were very careful in how they did that, because you will see also in what they say about him that they're trenchantly opposed to him as, as, as a person. You know, they attack the ball, the man and not the ball. But they're also kind of saying that, well, these issues need to be discussed. These these things are really important for us to be looking at. But they they really deride him as being superficially clever and, you know, that he's like a He's, he's, uh, all those kinds of things are come his way, uh, uh, and he 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 um, he eventually, and this I think is one of the complicating factors of it. 
he eventually he has a, a very fragile temperament and he has around the time of the war he has a, a breakdown and in the course of this he uh, leaves his positions and resiles from all his earlier interests and uh, when he writes his, his his memoir he mentions none of those things in it except the fact of course that they're recorded in the christian commonwealth which is which is lucky for for me lucky for me and uh, and in fact goes to the extent of uh, leaving instructions that all his papers should be burned uh, on his passing, which they were, so all of his material was gone. I don't think this is answering your question. I, I, I'm, I think he, he was certainly, I think what somebody described uh, as, you know, both, he was the disturber of our comfortable peace, one person wrote about him. You know, he was hugely famous. You could send in a halfpenny and get a picture of him. There were rosaries made of his writings. Uh, it rolled up into uh, his book, the uh, because he 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 founded this new uh, idea called the New Theology, which was seen as a Reformation movement within Protestant Christianity, and uh, that that this was the beginning of a new a new a new world, a new age, and lots and lots of people believed that. Um, I think also it's probably a response to the evangelical fervor because the evangelicalism was the evangelical movement, and that people like you described. That this, with um, in the liberal Christian um, uh, environment, one of the responses was not to go, not not to not to uh, be involved with that. And James James will know more about this than I do. But to actually uh, to uh, become involved in the spiritual journey outside of Christianity, looking for a a a, a narrative, a universal narrative that would uh, satisfy a, a new world that they felt was coming, uh, something of that nature. Could I just very briefly follow that up <clears throat> with... Uh, um, certainly can, Brian. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, James, no, you carry on. You've got loads of hands up. Thank you, Brian. No, no, please go ahead. We actually... Oh, um, just, just, but maybe a, just, a just to thing. ask... Um, just to ask um, that page in Arabic mm. on the front, um, W w w was he expecting anyone that bought the newspaper to be able to read that? In other words, was there a domestic audience of any kind that he was <laughs> that he that he did that for? It's a really great question. It was one of the mysteries. That I remember going to and, and coming back and talking to Oliver about the Christian Commonwealth, which we knew was there, and, and but I hadn't seen it. And and when we talked about it, Oliver said, "My goodness, that really is the core, the core of it, because it it is actually what gives this whole thing." Uh, focus because so much of the later accounts for various different reasons uh, don't include what actually is recorded there over a number of uh, a number of years but what actually when I looked at it what it actually betokened was a, a, a an interconnection between the Christian Commonwealth and the figures not just Campbell but a lot of other people who were behind this newspaper in um in in the interaction between them and this visiting religious uh, reformer Abdul Baha from 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 uh, from Asia, in that they were producing this in Arabic so that it could be sent to countries like Egypt, Arabic speaking countries. So thousands of these um, issues of this particular uh, uh, um, um, it, this particular issue, thousands of this particular issue were actually sent to countries like Egypt, Arabic speaking countries. So in a sense, they were promoting um, uh, the, the, the message of Abdul Baha or the, what Abdul Baha was saying through their newspaper abroad as well. Now, how that connected in with their own agenda and with their own uh, uh, the, the purposes is what I go into the book as well, because they had they had a reason for doing that, and it was part of of a movement. In you know, one way, you could say with with Max Muller as well as with with these uh, with these figures is that Christianity was still very when it was the it was the starting point, but it was also the terminus in terms of their search. So there was a, an idea of having a an overarching Christian uh, super Christianity of the future. Thank um, you. On that note, the overarching super Christianity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to say that we our time is up, and, oh, and so, so uh, and people can stay in in the meeting, but. In case anyone has to leave, I think uh, I'd like to lead a round of applause for Brendan. We haven't actually had a communal uh, round of applause. Um, would, you like, um, would you like to say anything um, before the formal close of the meeting? No, just uh, just another thank you. And I was just thinking how, how great it is to actually have 
um, former members of staff, affiliated members of staff of our department all here. I, I was wondering whether there'd ever be an occasion to have Brian and Oliver here with us. And it's just absolutely wonderful to have this um, uh, occasion shared with all of us. So it's just just great. And once again, Brendan, congratulations. Uh, we will post this. We now have a, a departmental YouTube channel, which we will post this there. So hopefully we will spread this far and wide. Thank you very much. And thank you, James, for cheering. Yeah. Thank you, Aman, for putting this together. And thanks to everybody for coming. It's been a great pleasure. And I'm terribly humbled by it all, to be honest. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations again. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, Brent. Well done. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks, Lawrence. Roll your ass, Thank you. And Brian, thank you so much. It's so good to see you all. Of you. So, so kind. It is. Right. right. So, uh, is that it? <laughs> That it, James? Yeah. That's it. Um, technically, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's it, but okay. anyone can stay and, and chat a bit longer. Who's uh, got the wine? The meeting's still open. And it's still being recorded. That was a, it's still being recorded. <laughs>